Okay, thanks very much. I am Julian Thomas, uh, and I, I think I'm in the extremely lucky position of teaching the theory module because I bloody love theory. <laughs> uh, let me start with a little anecdote uh, about a university long, long ago and far, far away when I was in very much the same position as Kathy Freeman in her very first uh, paper in this session where I was introducing the theory module for the first time where no theory module had been before. And I rocked up and gave the first lecture. And after the first lecture, there was a formal complaint <laughs> to, <laughs> to the staff student consultative committee from a group of students who thought it was absolutely outrageous that they, against their will, were being forced to study this absolutely dreadful stuff. Um, ten weeks later, the same group of students presented me with this lovely tea light, which I, I now cherish, um, tea light holder rather, uh, because they love the course so much. <laughs> and I, I, I hope I'm not saying this in any kind of boastful way, because really what I want to, to make from this is that this notorious hatred of theory on the part of students, I think is often a matter of perception. I think it's very much to do with trepidation before the event. When we first arrive at university, our conception of the subject that we're about to study probably revolves around excavation and artefacts and Roman villas and gold and burials and palm trees, let's have some of all of that, um, <laughs> lost civilizations, all that kind of stuff. And theory may not be something that we're expecting to encounter. The impression that it's something alien, extrinsic and supplementary to the more fundamental issues of digging and studying objects is often enhanced by the way that the theory module is held in abeyance and it only comes on the scene in the second year. By that stage, theory not only appears to be an optional extra, there's also been plenty of opportunity <laughs> for students to absorb a whole series of scare stories that are difficult, incomprehensible, unnecessarily, and generally batshit crazy archaeological theory is. When you come to, the, to present the first lecture, then, in the theory module, you find that you're already confronted with a whole mass of negative expectations. So I very strongly agree with what Penny Bickle was just saying about the importance of teaching theory from the very beginning of the degree course, conveying the idea that it's a normal, integral part of what we do as archaeologists. Now, I've always done this through the history of archaeology course. And I, th I think what I've tried to do really is to subvert that course and turn it into a history of archaeological thought, which I know Helen is not going to be remotely happy with. Um, but I guess that this is a kind of, of theory by stealth. Because the argument that I seek to convey in that course is that archaeology has always been sustained by ideas, uh, even if those ideas have often been implicit. And you know, with Matthew in the room, I hope no one's going to disagree, even empiricism is a theory. And the kinds of sites and artefacts that archaeologists have been interested in, the ways in which they've acquired their information, have always been underwritten to a greater or less, ex or less extent by some set of philosophical preoccupations. Equally, the chronological succession from antiquarianism and artifact classification to the new archaeology, post-processualism, feminism and so on, I think is quite a useful device that enables theoretical concerns to become more uh, explicit as you progress through that first year. In effect, I think that the history of, history of archaeology and my second year course, Theory and Philosophy of, of Archaeology, are a single two-year course which starts running in chronological sequence and then flattens out in the second year to give an overview of the contemporary theoretical scene. My view is that we are inducting students into the discipline of archaeology as a kind of apprenticeship, and that one of the most important jobs that we can do is to place them into that developing tradition by making them aware of how we've come to now think what we do. Moreover, I think it's helpful for students to have acquired already during the first year that, that sequence of first there was culture history, then there was processual archaeology, then there was post-processual archaeology, 
because you're going to want to turn that on its head to a certain extent and deconstruct it when you get to the second year. Now in this presentation, I want to reflect a little on the experience of teaching archaeological theory in three universities over quite a long time and try and convey some of what has worked for me. And I emphasise very much that this has been very much a, a, a process of, of trial and error. And I'm just going to show you what has perhaps worked for me. And again, I think one of the points that I want to make is that in that process, I've, I've been trying to learn from the students as much as they're learning from me. And that's a, a point that I'm going to come back to. One of the questions that this session is designed to address is whether or not we still need the theory module as a standalone course. And I want to argue very emphatically that we do, although I'm quite aware that this does present us with a serious problem. Teaching archaeological theory as a separate unit can reinforce the notion that it's a specific kind of archaeology, that it, it's a specialism, something like animal bones or GIS, and that it's therefore something reserved for a particular kind of archaeology, or a particular kind of archaeologist. I think we all know what we mean by that. So it's absolutely imperative to continually make the connections between theory and all of the other parts of the syllabus, and to point out that because of these connections, it's actually the course that potentially draws the rest of the degree programme together. Now, one reaction to the perception that theory is isolated and optional has been to try and teach it in an embedded way, just as case studies, or to put little bits of theory into other courses, or to say, you know, theory is in everything we do, everything we do is theoretical. And I think that's fatal. There does need to be a place and a time for explicitly reflecting on theory. It's not adequate, I think, to simply say, oh, this is a Marxist interpretation, or a feminist would say that. At some point, you have to explain what those labels mean and where these ideas come from. Indeed, I'd actually argue that it's patronising to the students to suggest that they shouldn't be required at some point to meet theory head on. So, the second year course that I've developed over the years involves a combination of thematic issues and conceptual frameworks. So on the one hand, I'll teach a series of topics like style and function, analogy, context, temporality, the archaeological record, and so on. And on the other, a series of isms, structuralism, Marxism, critical theory, hermeneutics, assemblage theory, and so on. And both of those approaches are fine, but personally, I found that the latter works better because it enables you to have the opportunity to concentrate on a specific intellectual tradition and the way in which it's being tailored for its archaeological use. It's always tempting, I think, to try and cover absolutely everything in your course, but over the years, I've decided that it's, it's probably better to try and focus down, to do fewer things and to do them in depth. I've also come to, to late in the day, to, to value the, the huge two-hour lecture slots that we get at Manchester University, which originally I found um, uh, quite daunting. Now I think that that big block of putting stuff across is really quite useful. So in my second year course, I have just 11 topics, each given the space to breathe. For each issue, there needs to be a narrative not just a set of ideas that are boldly presented. What I think needs to be conveyed is why a particular set of ideas emerged in the first place, and what sort of problems it was intended to address, and then why archaeologists were attracted to the approach and what they sought to use it to do. So, for instance, I don't think you can set out to try and explain the structure of it without saying, who Ferdinand de Saussure and Claude Lévi-Strauss were, and say something about their intellectual projects. Why did they imagine that something like a universal science of the sign was a useful thing to have? And similarly, I don't think you can talk about critical theory without introducing the fact that school and saying a little bit about the crisis of scientific knowledge immediately after the First World War. But equally, you need to provide worked examples 
of how each approach has been put to work by archaeologists, the kinds of problems and evidence that allowed them, it's allowed them to address, and the kinds of conclusions that enabled them to come to. So, for instance, why was it that Ian Hodder thought that it was a good thing to do to look at structured pairs of oppositions drawn from structuralist approaches as a way of trying to address TRB pottery? Now, it's increasingly a commonplace that all archaeology is theoretical and to say that we're all doing theory all the time, whether we like it or not. But I think it, the other really important message that we should be emphasising in our teaching is that theory allows us to create new knowledge about the past. Theory enables us to have new insights. It enables us to think things that we could not have thought if we went to the evidence alone. So whatever other courses you as a student might be studying, it's possible to bring these insights to bear and to come up with something new. That's, that's what we really need to be saying. Now, I'm aware that that's a rather instrumentalist argument, and that it does run the risk of reducing archaeological theory down to the status of a, a kind of toolkit, which is simply applied to the material in a mechanistic kind of way. And that, again, is why I think we need to look at each approach in some depth, because it's not, again, just a matter of saying, here are the ideas and here's how you use them. We also need to be addressing the questions of, well, what are the potential drawbacks? What are the ethical and political implications of using these kinds of approaches? And also, why is it that some of these ideas have flourished when they've come into archaeology, and why have some of them fallen by the wayside? Marvin Harris famously argued that eclecticism is a recipe for intellectual incoherence, but I don't think that can possibly apply when we're talking about teaching. Although I've argued that we have to, it's best to be selective in what you cover in an archaeological theory course, I think it should be the stuff that is important and influential and useful that you should be using, not just the stuff that you personally happen to like. We aren't trying, I think, to make converts to any one school of thought, so much as telling students that they must think something. The corollary of that is that, just like any other course unit, teaching archaeological theory should force you to read a whole lot of stuff that you wouldn't necessarily normally be going near. I've always thought of the archaeological theory course <coughs> as something that I learn from just as much as the students. And just as with any other unit, it's really important to keep renewing the course, to keep bringing things and <coughs> new things in. And again, the counterside of that is that you have to kill your darlings as well. So although I've really enjoyed at various times teaching psychoanalysis or performance theory, whatever, they've at certain points had to go. They've had to, to make space for things like assemblage theory, new materialism, symmetrical archaeology, and so on. Okay, so far, I've said a lot about the topics that I'm lecturing, but I'd emphasise as well that the theory course demands space for discussion. So I teach it each week with a two-hour lecture and a one-hour seminar in a much smaller group. I structure those seminars around readings related to the week's lecture, but they also provide students with an opportunity to discuss what they do and don't understand and to talk about what might or might not be useful to their archaeology. And again, this is always surprising. It's rarely that they understand what you do, imagine that they're, they're, they're going to, and they come back with, with quite surprising insights. So again, listen to the students, I think. Um, OK. I think it's also really important to get students reading. So the way that you structure the seminar around the reading is useful and if over a period of 11 weeks you've got them to read 11 quite dense theoretical readings that's a win but again that's quite an imposition on their time so thinking about assessment is really important um, what i've done in practice is to throw out any idea of having an essay or any idea of having an exam and have the assessment entirely as a logbook uh, a logbook is something that i stole from Dan Hicks and Josh Pollard when I was external examiner at, at, at Bristol. 
and I think that's what we call sharing best practice. But uh, <laughs> uh, what, what it is, is that each week they read uh, a, a particular text, they have a seminar on that text, they then go away and write an entry in which they reflect on what they've read, they try to bring in insights from the conversation that they've had in the seminar, and hopefully they come up with ideas of their own, and above all, they try to make connections with their other courses, and that's what gets them the marks. That logbook, then, is submitted twice. Halfway through the semester, they send it to me by email, and I give them some informative comments on what they do. And then finally, at the end of the, the, the semester, they hand it in through turn it in, and it's at that point that they get summative as well as formative feedback. So what I'm hoping is that the combination of the lecture and the seminar, and the reading, and the logbook entry means that each student is going to have focused quite densely on a particular series of topics. Now, does that work? I think it does. Over the years that I've been teaching archaeological theory, my experience has been that the students don't hate it at all. But they do need to be shown that it's relevant, and that it positively contributes to our understanding of the past. In my view, that can only be achieved through having a dedicated theory module and having the space to demonstrate where the ideas that we're using have come from, why they've been brought into archaeology, and then the kind of interpretations and the kind of new knowledge that they've, they've enabled us to create. Okay, I'll stop there. Thanks very much.